Okay, we'll go ahead and get started here. Welcome to another Ask Me Anything session. Um, today's session is focused on machine learning and artificial intelligence in Yellowfin, um, plugging your own solutions in, how to integrate them, and how to really get those kinds of, of um, solutions and opportunities across the last mile. I'm uh, Chance Cole. I'm with a long-standing Yellowfin partner called Blacklight Solutions. Um, been working with Yellowfin for about, uh, well, 14 years now, if you can believe it. I can't. Um, so I've mostly been focusing on doing um, applications that are embedded in our customers' products for their customers, uh, as well as uh, those that require advanced analytics, some component of machine learning uh, to add into their, their report and analytics development. So uh, today's Ask Me Anything session, if you've been to one of these before, I'm gonna introduce the topic a little bit. I'm gonna go through a few points that I think are important considerations for today as you, as you look at a solution going forward, or if you're in the middle of a solution, some things that possibly I think could accelerate you and reduce your risks. Uh, and then after I do that introduction, uh, then we will open it up for questions and you're welcome to, as the title says, ask me anything. So. Let's get started with uh, some conceptual items. So this, this idea of the last mile in artificial intelligence and machine learning has really become concerning to me as I go out and consult with a lot of different companies. One, because there are a lot of misunderstandings about this. There's a lot of attention on some very recent developments in artificial intelligence, especially. There's a lot of confusion out there. Um, so what I see is that a lot of organizations see the value in this. They see an opportunity to capture some of the value that they've seen over the last 20 years and companies that have been becoming more and more advanced, many of them large enterprises. And those companies that are new to it, sometimes they'll turn to outside contractors to build solutions, machine learning models, uh, implement some kind of AI solution. But then when it comes to incorporating that in their business process or getting that content out to their customers, that's where they really struggle. And there are a few reasons why they struggle with that, in my opinion. One is that there's a lot of attention on these press-worthy results and attention on the new algorithms that have come out that seem to enable those press-worthy results. For example, a new artificial intelligence algorithm beats the world chess champion was a big headline in 1998. Later it was Go, later it was Jeopardy. Um, we see these, these advancements in artificial intelligence do things that we then see in the news and start thinking about how we can bring that back to our business. Although those tend to be some of the most advanced and specialized applications. What you'll usually use in your business are more generalized sets of tools, platforms that build these solutions for you, but then don't necessarily give you any way to publish them into your business processes. Uh, a lot of times in that case, those technologies are created very far from where the solution is gonna be used. In other words, you hire an outside team, you bring in specialists, data scientists, anything like that, teams with those specialized skills in building those models um, that don't necessarily have the skills in your domain to deploy them with some of the domain specific concerns that your customers have or that your business stakeholders are gonna have when they're actually using those models. They're also built with no clear channel for use. So they might have a use case defined in terms of how information like this or uh, an intelligence like this, this automation can really benefit your business, but no way that that automation is actually going to be published into your business. Is this going to be an email that goes out in the middle of the night? Is this gonna be a report that helps us with decision-making? Is this gonna be an automated uh, back-end action that creates a hook into some third-party enterprise integration? Those kinds of things really need to be determined as you're thinking about how the intelligence, the automation of the decision support is gonna be used that this AI or machine learning enables. And so these types of use cases that I've seen very commonly in, uh, in deployments that especially around a business intelligence platform like Yellowfin are relevant, uh, identifying disruptions in time series, operational data, or possibly sales forecasting data, ranking opportunities or risks. If you're looking at, for example, a CRM, understanding which of those prospects and opportunities you might want to capture the most 
or going in the opposite direction, which of those customers are most likely to leave, scoring those records, looking through and actually understanding and classifying those, um, those records in your existing data uh, are all valuable ways to either mitigate risk or take advantage of opportunities. But the question really is, once you have that intelligence, how do you then get that information in front of the people that need it and make it part of your regular business process with minimal disruption to their existing work and processes? So moving on from that, let's talk a little bit about the vocabulary just to make sure we're on the same page. When I use terms like model or algorithm or training, these are all things that I think come up in uh, regular discourse around this topic. And a lot of people have different ideas of what each of those pieces mean. So I'm going to talk to you about the way that I'm using them here and the way that I'll use them whenever I architect a solution or think through what exactly is needed. So whether we're talking about machine learning, whether we're talking about artificial intelligence, these are both terms that have decades of baggage that come with them, of examples. And so often people are saying, you know, okay, well, how do you define the difference between these two? I'm gonna talk about things in, in the more general sense of what I come to call machine intelligence. And so this is anytime you're using one of these models, whether it comes from artificial intelligence or more specifically techniques in machine learning that um, wind up giving you some kind of response for some kind of input. And I would really like to reduce it to that level. So what we're really talking about here when we start this conversation about a solution is what are you gonna put into this and what are you expecting out? And if you can just get that far, the actual underlying tech can be obfuscated a little bit. It can be abstracted or encapsulated, so we don't have to worry about it as much. And maybe we can try a number of different solutions, but the key is we have a certain set of inputs to find and we know what we're expecting out of it. So we start with the data, the data you already have in your organization or can access through enrichment from a third party that you can use as what I'm call, calling training data or possibly data for back testing once you have this solution in place. There's some kind of architecture combined with an algorithm. Uh, this part, you can just stop there. You don't need to worry about it any further unless you're actually involved in the development of the technology. And this is where you're getting into things like, okay, are we gonna use a large language model? Are we gonna use a neural network? Or are we gonna use this specific kind of uh, back propagating neural network with this algorithm? So on and so forth. So that you at some point have that machine learning technology bundled up in there. When you apply training data to an architecture with an algorithm, that is when you get the model. And when I say model, I mean something that is specific to the data you've trained it on and the architecture and algorithm you've used. So when we talk about large language models or when we talk about neural networks or any of these other things that some of you may, you may make your eyes gloss over, uh, some of you may be very interested in those technical details. I personally am kind of a nerd about it. Um, but uh, when you talk about those things, and I talk about them producing a model, that means they have been applied to a specific data set. The same technology applied to a lot of different data will produce a lot of different results, a lot of different models, because it is based on the data that it was trained on. That's actually the benefit, and to some degree, the, the challenge with these kinds of technologies. It turns out one of the things we've learned over the decades is that there is no perfect architecture and algorithm combination. It all depends on what you're trying to get out of the data that you're actually gonna train it on. In other words, all learning requires error. So error is implied in these things. You know you're gonna have some. What you want is the right kind of error. So you're ignoring the right kind of data and you're paying attention to the right kind of data. So if you're trying to classify, for example, customers that are going to churn and you're trying to identify that risk, you want it to ignore the things that don't actually predict churn but really pay attention to those things that, that seem to actually predict it. And that's uh, going to be a matter of sensitivity, both to your training data, as well as to the algorithm that you end up using in the architecture. So all that aside, we've got data, we had our architecture and algorithm, we come out with a model. Now, once you have that model, this where we're below this uh, horizontal line here, you see below the training data in our architecture and algorithm, is where you come to the model, this is where I actually see people have trouble incorporating it into their business processes. So when you have this model from your training, I've actually found a lot of companies have an easy time getting to this point. 
they actually don't find it as challenging as they thought to take one of these technologies, especially with the open source platforms available out there today and apply it to their data and then produce a model. What they do have trouble with is how do we incorporate that model result into our business systems with existing software or with something that will blend well with our existing software. And that's the challenge I'm here to talk about today and uh, some of the ways that you can make it easier to get started on these steps with training data and getting those models output. But then mostly you take a tool like Yellowfin, how do you integrate that model so you can get those results in your data? And there are three ways that I see to do that easily. There's essentially working below the database, um, applying it into your processing as you bring in raw data and then storing it in your database. There is actually calling on the uh, machine learning model in your database, which is specific to your database technology. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges around that. And then there is invoking it above the database. That's actually in memory in Yellowfin using some specific integration functions of Yellowfin. Okay. So let's start with below the database. We're bringing it into our processing. Often this would be some kind of an EDL process or possibly um, some other scripting that we do in the data on in the background so that we're storing the results of our model. So if we wanna go back to that churn example and I wanna take a look at my data and I've got a trained model that would tell me given a new customer record, is this customer likely to churn soon? Um, is, am I gonna lose this account? Is this account at risk? Any kind of score or yes, no answer I put to that, I wanna go ahead if I'm gonna do a below the database approach, run that in the background and store it in the database so that I can just report on it as normal data. Great answer to being able to treat the results of a machine learning model as though they're just results in a table that you can then report on. Because now naturally any type of downstream tool you use, if you're using Yellowfin to generate reports on this, you can include it just like it's any other data in your database. Great, right? Of course, there are some challenges, even though it's flexible to pretty much any kind of machine learning you wanna do because you are doing it in the background, you can take as much time with it as you want. Um, it is also uh, something that requires latency because it's being processed in the background and then stored in the database. So if you need something that is really up to date, very dependent on current time series, anything like that, this would become a challenge. If you have a process that's only running every 24 hours, you're not gonna have the results of your machine lear learning model more recently than 24 hours. So sometimes that latency is a real issue when you're doing this below the database. Doing this work inside the database. Now, when you do this in the database, as I mentioned before, this is very specific to the kind of database technology you have or results that you can uh, model, excuse me, that you can implement directly in SQL. Sometimes that creates very sophisticated SQL. And because of that, this is a little more technically challenging to integrate than say doing things below the database where you might lean on your data science team to produce that model in such a way that you can call on it in a scripted background and just have it loaded into your database for reporting. In this case, they're creating the model. You have your data in your database. And then at the time the report is generated, you're triggering Yellowfin to go call on that model in the database on the data that's coming through in the report and generate the results, what I use the term just in time. In other words, just as the report is being generated, that's when the results for your model are being generated. So it's very timely. It comes across the moment that uh, you request the report. So you know the data you're seeing is as fresh as it can possibly be. But you know also that it's gonna be dependent on the database you use. So there are some databases out there that support open standards like PMML, not many though. And so you might have to go get a separate plugin for your database or in the example that I'm gonna show you here where I pulled in some crime data for uh, the city of Austin. I put this on a Yellowfin dashboard and I'm doing this all actually in SQL to invoke the model that I trained. Um, and so by doing that, what I've done is use a Yellowfin custom function. And uh, I'll go through the details of how you put together a Yellowfin custom function in the future webinar. I think we're gonna be doing it next month where we really get into some of the details of how you integrate these things. But right now in this AMA, what I wanna do is just highlight the technique and show you that this is one possible way to do it in addition to loading things and the model results before you load the data, you can make these calls actually inside database. 
And then the final technique that I want to walk through is doing this stuff above the database. When you call on these machine learning models above the database, you're getting some of the same benefits as being able to call it call on it in database, but now you're making a call to an outside uh, service or possibly some kind of uh, software library. So if you're doing something very specific that requires custom code, this is often a very powerful solution. Obviously, this is the most technically sophisticated integration of your machine learning model because it probably requires someone with a software engineering background, somebody who knows how to code and script so that they can make that advanced function in Yellowfin call on either a web service that they've created or call on some kind of library or script. When you use Yellowfin's advanced functions, however, to do this, you're able to integrate that call directly into Yellowfin, make it however you want to make it, so it's highly flexible, and then you're making it in real time as you pull the results back from Yellowfin. I'm going to show an example of that in relation to credit scoring. So when you do this, you can also include open standards like PMML. If, in case you haven't heard of what that is, uh, predictive model markup language is an open standard out there for describing machine learning models and essentially what looks like an XML file. And so if, you, um, uh, if you're able to do that, you can have one set, one kind of function uh, that you then go out and call on um, based on what you've deployed in that PMML file, that model descriptor. So once you've trained your model, the output is a PMML file, and then you drop that somewhere that it gets read dynamically by that advanced function. So if you can do that either in your database or above the database, so it's all happening in memory, then you're getting those real-time results from your machine learning model that's already been built and deployed. And in some cases, I've even set up, for example, tournaments where I look at the performance of each model when I back test it against old data, and then the one that wins, that's the PMML file that gets deployed and it gets dropped into Yellowfin. Um, and then you wind up with what under current testing turns out to be the best model uh, to be uh, available for, uh, for the fitness of the function you're trying to, to uh, execute. So when you, uh, when you use these kind of techniques, you're getting that, as I said, just in time result, just like with the database, uh, with the end database call, but obviously lower latency than if you try to do it below the database and load everything into the database first. Um, PMML, by the way, was just one option. Uh, I just wanted to explain what it was. You can make this call on any kind of a library or underlying web service. As long as the results come back fast enough, and most of these models execute pretty quickly, as long as the results come back fast enough so that you can actually incorporate them in a report uh, as you're requesting the report. So you want the call to be pretty low latency. Most models actually meet that requirement. They don't always train very fast. In fact, training can take days. Uh, but once it trains and you have the model, usually you can call on them in milliseconds. So just to summarize this before I do a little walkthrough of Yellowfin, the benefits and challenges of each of these, when we start out with this above, or excuse me, let's start out at the bottom here, below the database, supported techniques are very broad just-in-time results are not available below the database. So you're loading this into the database on your regular uh, data loading or ETL process. And when you do that, you're probably doing it on a cadence of daily, maybe hourly or every 15 minutes. But most often it's not gonna be uh, fast enough for you to actually get the results at the time you request the report. It's going to be stored from history and you're looking at some kind of historical result. Uh, doing it in the database, supported techniques are a little bit more limited, but your just-in-time results are there. And of course, I put a, a cautionary sign on the simplicity of the integration because it does tend to get a little more complicated, but it also depends on the kind of database you're using. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server, for example, has some very extensive functions and coding capabilities with user-defined functions. Not every database platform has that. And so, uh, whether or not you can implement it in SQL or whether or not you have to use some backend library or attachment to your database, or if your database even supports that kind of thing, is going to be very much up to your, um, your choice of database platform and how sophisticated that integration is. So that's not right for everybody, not right for every database platform. And then finally, above the database, supported techniques are very broad, just-in-time results. They come back in real time as you request their report. And of course, it is the most advanced type of integration. So you're probably going to need a fairly technically sophisticated support resource to come in and help you actually put that together. So 
What I'd like to do now is I'll just show a few uh, examples of the kinds of content that we've been talking about and, um, and how they look when they're put together in Yellowfin, and then I will open it up for questions. So let me share my screen here. Okay, and let's see if that comes up properly. All right, it does. So what we're looking at here is a very, uh, very basic Yellowfin dashboard. Up here at the top, I have my below database results. So what I've done in this case is I've gone and scraped a bunch of grocery store data across a few different retailers, and these are all for products. Now, in the background, what I used was a uh, topic modeling algorithm and architecture that goes through and looks at the description of all of those products, and then it extracts the umbrella or product category. It tries to do that automatically, and it's working across 60 or 70,000 products. Um, uh, and so... Uh, let's see if I can kind of zoom in because someone's saying the resolution on the screen is really low. Oops. Let's try sharing. All right, how's that? Okay, so uh, what I was saying is we're scraping all of this retail data. We've got these different products here. At this time, I've filtered this for coffee to get the, um, the underlying umbrella of, um, of categorical results. And you can see them where I've extracted both the price per unit as well as the overall product price. Now, if we go in and we try to grab the, uh, let's just say a different type of product. Let's go with something like salmon. And we're looking for everything that they sell in terms of uh, salmon, fish. And so we'll, uh, um, we'll take a look at what they sell, both in terms of total product price, as well as the price per unit. Um, and so for the different retailers here, you can actually see uh, for different types of sushi, you've got pretty high end. You've got some across the central market retailer tend to be a little bit higher than the others that are jumbled all down here and then um, each of these products that go out here. But the idea is we're able to filter and search based on this over product category, rather than searching on, uh, you know, say uh, partial text in the description or something like that, which, you know, for cases like jam may actually include, you know, jambalaya as well as, you know, including the kind of, you know, product category jam Okay, so that's one example doing this below the database. And of course, because we go and get all these products at once, it's okay. We can afford the latency of not having a real-time execution. Now here, an Austin crime cluster, we're actually going in and taking a look at uh, each of the different segments of Austin. And I've done all of the theft crime and loaded that data. And I'm using in database a clustering across the geography of Austin to go grab uh, different profiles of crime. And then you can see things like when you pop into these, like maybe in the West here, um, you're getting, oh, what do you get? You get something like 16, 17% auto theft, whereas you go into the, the Northeast here and you can see that the profile is quite different and you get something more like, yeah, right about 30% of, uh, of uh, all crime is auto theft. And so you're seeing these different profiles of crime across the city and in terms of both the type of crime that occurs, and this is clustered so that you can actually see a kind of similarity of records by both geography and crime profile. And so that is happening um, because in the actual report, and again, we're gonna do a webinar in the future where we'll really walk through um, uh, I'll walk through the, uh, the details of how this is implemented. 
Um, but uh, but for now, I'll, I think I already hit that. There we go. But for now, I'll just show you really quickly. This happens through a custom function in Yellowfin, which is an additional integration that you can do. You can see here I've actually added this function into Yellowfin, and I'll show you how in that in that more detailed webinar. And then I'm able to parameterize it with what I want to parameterize it with, so it goes and grabs the appropriate cluster, and that's how we include that data in our report. Anybody out there who's seeing low resolution, by the way, you can also maximize the media player so that it will uh, hopefully show you a little more detail on the screen. I was seeing a couple of comments about that. And then finally, when we get down here to the housing type credit scores, um, when we look at this, what I'm doing is I've gone and grabbed a bunch of uh, credit data from public records that are anonymized. I've looked at whether or not they own, rent, or live in housing that they don't pay for. And then the purple are the good credit scores and the blue are the failed credit uh, applications. And so uh, this is all based on that predictive model of whether or not they're, they would be good or bad. And so just to kind of show you that, this is the above the database real-time call into a more technically sophisticated integration. And you can see I'm using a Yellowfin advanced function here when I pop in to edit the report. So this breakdown may or may not be interesting to you, but most importantly, I think it is this concept that if you have something out there that's a more sophisticated or a highly customized approach to calling on a data science or AI or machine learning solution, you can actually use these advanced functions here. And you do that just by going into the advanced function. There are a number that are already available to you in Yellowfin uh, through both the analysis as well as the st statistical functions. I've created my, mo my own here that I just called machine learning model indication. And so once I do that, it goes in and executes on this, uh, this model whenever I request a report. So it doesn't do it at the time that we're uh, actually looking to develop the report. It does it when I request the data. So in real time, just as I'm looking at the report. So as long as I have something that I can call on with fairly low latency, call on fairly quickly, then I can include that in real time in my report. And so with that, I'll head back to the dashboard and we're done with a little demonstration that I was going to show you. So we'll come back here. And now I think we will enter the Q&A period of the Ask Me Anything. So thanks very much for that, uh, that time for the introduction. We have the rest of the time here just for questions. Um, and I will uh, just kind of start making some notes. We've already got a bunch in, so I'll start uh, answering them. Let's just kind of start with uh, with Greg's question here. When working below the database, are there still the same issues with model drift and hallucinations that you have to deal with above the D? Well, um, there are a couple there. Uh, I'd say model drift, absolutely. Hallucinations are a term that kind of has come up a little more recently in specific around kind of generated AI and uh, with some of the large language models. Uh, I'm not sure I recommend large language models in general in these kinds of BI applications yet. We're kind of still in our sophomore year of AI in this way. And because when we want business intelligence solutions, the accuracy is very important. I don't typically immediately think large language models when I'm looking at BI applications that have to give me very specific information uh, that has to be accurate, otherwise it's useless or worse than useless if it gives me something inaccurate, uh, has a hallucination. Um, if I, you know, doing the same thing with flying planes or, uh, or surgery or anything that's really safety critical or critical to business decisions, um, I would say large language models, that's something to proceed with a lot of caution. So those hallucinations absolutely would be a, would be a challenge there. Uh, in terms of drift, that's a really interesting uh, comment and question because any time you're dealing with, say, uh, classifiers or estimators or predictors of data, and you bring those kinds of uh, intelligent components in, over time, the data will sometimes change. The, the features of the data will change. You will see drift, certainly. 
Um, and so, uh, especially in the underlying ground truth of the data and the model needs to be retrained. And in my experience, you should always plan on that kind of retraining of the model on more current data so that you continue to get those accurate results. So that drift is actually, uh, it's a problem that does require ongoing maintenance in almost any solution where you're deploying these kinds of, of techniques. Uh, let's see, we've also got How does AI get trained or equipped with industry knowledge, uh, company knowledge to be able to analyze the data through Yellowfin and draw conclusions that are related to industry or company? So in this case, this is really where I go back to that slide about uh, specific to how you're pulling from your own data or data you have access to, the architecture and the algorithm that you're applying. And so if that isn't something you're comfortable with, there are tons of teams, individual contractors, companies, and tools out there that will apply that data science for you. Uh, one of the real challenges I see with it is that uh, sometimes people will go out and they'll look at, for example, AWS SageMaker, and it says it makes machine learning easy. Um, and there's a big part of it that does. It really will go out there and, and you know, uh, train on your data. It'll create a model for you, and it does it pretty well. Uh, but then it doesn't really give you any idea of how to deploy those results once you have all available. And so that's one of the reasons why I like to focus on this part of the conversation. I do think there are a number of tools out there that can really help you with building those models, though, because that's been an area of, of great focus over the last 20 years. And especially now that AI has been such a hot topic in the press, there are a lot of people who are just tripping over themselves to develop new tools and support uh, ways to create these models for businesses. The real challenge I see out there, though, is they're just there. There aren't a lot of good solutions in, in gluing those results into a business and using it as part of your standard business practice and understanding how to benefit from it. Uh, what applications of Yellowfin and the AI stack and the financial services have been deployed? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so let's see. I think there are a ton of examples. Oh, so I'll give you a couple that, that I've worked on. Uh, I did some work in relation to uh, in retail uh, trading that was related to analyzing kind of the bid and the ask as they come from market makers and sort of create a visual that almost looks like a, a valley. Uh, so as uh, opportunities to buy and sell, for example, equities like stocks uh, come across, then you can um, then you see all the people out there who are looking to buy and sort of a bid side, and then all the people are looking uh, uh, to sell and kind of an ask side. And so uh, the ask then is kind of, you know, it starts kind of low in terms of the number of people. And then as you as you uh, 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 increase the price, it goes up, the number of people that would sell at that point. And so I've used uh, machine learning to summarize some of those results and kind of demand on each side. So you can kind of see when the bid and the ask maybe aren't really aligned. Uh, and you can create models around whether or not those are good good opportunities for for retail trading. Uh, I've done some work around uh, derivatives like options uh, that uh, take a look at, for example, if you go very long in terms of your expiration date and then you go very far out of the money, sometimes the distance out of the money um, is less than the discount you're getting for the um, for the risk you're taking on the option. And so I've used machine learning sometimes to estimate uh, how much risk you would take if you wound up engaging those positions and use those not so much as a recommender, but kind of a, an opportunity analysis for um, for different positions you might get into or get out of. So there's a lot of lot of that. A lot of, you know, of course, risk management is always big. Anytime you're in financial services, you know, you have one account <laughs> that can really blow up a firm if they if they allow it to get out of hand. And so uh, especially in retail. And so um, so I've used that uh, quite a bit in terms of risk management as well. Hopefully that helps with some relevant examples. Um, what machine learning models are prepackaged and available for the user to apply to a data set in Yellowfin? So it's really difficult to prepackage models because they so often depend on the actual data. However, there are some that are very generic that can be used and some models that are actually built on the fly in Yellowfin. For example, uh, if you take a look at Yellowfin signals, um, that is more or less a model that's built on the fly. Uh, so what it'll do is take uh, your recent data and in the background process, it will take a look at everything that that recent data has done in terms of its behavior. And if it's recent, very recent behavior, if it's latest behavior, 
has not been in profile holistically with that uh, with that recent history, then it will flag it as a as a signal. And so that's an example of yellowfin in the background using some machine learning to build a model on, on the recent behavior of a time series, and then to uh, flag it when it doesn't meet what that model would estimate within a certain error range. Um, there's another example with uh, assisted insights, which I've given demos of on, on other webinars, um, where it will go through and do a search essentially um, of all of the ways that maybe variants happened across a couple of categories or something like that. And so through all those slices, of course, you get a lot of pairwise results, not all of them are relevant, and then it will use uh, essentially uh, an algorithm to learn to train on which of those results should be ranked higher and should be displayed as a possible explanation of the uh, of the results. So I wouldn't say that they're out of the box models. I would say that they're models that are more crafted on the fly. And so Yellowfin's obviously put a lot of work into being able to run those models in such a way that they run efficiently so that when you hit the button or for signals in the background, when it crunches the data, it crunches that data and uh, is able to produce results in a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable ask from the processor. Uh, so it doesn't wind up clogging up your, your server any more than necessary anyway. Do you use uh, generative AI for analytic models? Where is my data gonna be stored and moved to when being analyzed with your AI and ML model? So in the case of uh, Yellowfin, Yellowfin is, uh, um, is a, a, a on-prem uh, product that also has a cloud offering. So anytime you do a cloud offering uh, and you engage it in a way that it's hosted, uh, that's the only time you would ever have data that is stored um, offsite and it would be stored in the cloud, but your, your source data is not stored that way. Your source data is typically usually stored in your own repository and has your own security functions around it. The only piece of your data that actually goes through that cloud process is what you're really reporting on, and that's secured, of course, by Yellowfin. So your models uh, are only deployed in Yellowfin in the event that you deploy in that above the database kind of fashion. And in that case, that's not really uh, deploying your data other than what is reported on through that, that model. So when, you're, when your model is called upon, um, then it will go to your source data, which is stored uh, locally for you and then we'll pull and, and generate that report. And that's really the only time your data is sent through Yellowfin. All of that, of course, is encrypted in flight uh, as a best practice, and then um, is displayed to an authenticated user in that case. So I wouldn't actually say the data is stored, um, even in a hosted scenario, is stored uh, in the cloud or offsite. Um, are AI apps ready to use or need development? ML modeling, what types of apps are ready to use, uh, how to integrate the data, and what type of AI is available, tools or apps, and artificial intelligence. So I think actually, uh, you know, there's there's a lot here that's really ready for the show, even if you don't have a very technically sophisticated team. Uh, I typically work uh, very close to the mid-market. So a lot of the companies I work with don't have their own software engineering teams, uh, and they're just kind of getting started on some of these tech technology implementations. And I've had a lot of success bringing machine learning to them once they've got their data to a state that it is organized and dependable. Uh, once you get to that point, you can do a lot of things with automatically uh, classifying, categorizing data. Those are actually fairly easy wins because those are not the, the granted, the, the latest bleeding edge of technology. They are something that over the last decade, you've seen more and more propagate throughout industries. And so, you know, the benefit of that is that they become easier and easier to implement. So if you're not doing something like that already with your data, I would say, you know, you're starting to get a little bit behind the curve. Um, if you uh, are looking for something that's a little more bleeding edge, obviously that's something you'd approach with caution. I've already talked about some of my concerns around generative AI or large language models, those kinds of things that uh, bring in some of the uncertainty uh, that, you know, the very human sounding responses that they, they can generate uh, afford, they, you know, they also uh, are prone to uh, less specific information and, and more kind of a comfortable human interaction experience. And there's, there's a lot of work to try to work on, you know, what uh, to try to improve the way that they approach those, those errors, the way that they uh, sometimes hallucinate is another uh, question kind of brought up. And then also what kind of bias they see. Um, so anytime you train on a specific data set, that data set is going to be biased. Uh, in some form or fashion. And so uh, obviously 
uh, large language models are very susceptible to that. And that's a big, big area of study right now. Uh, let's see, the guided NLQ is great for producing self-serve results that are easy, valid, and avoid the pitfalls of having results produced uh, by generative AI, like co-pilot hallucinations, reporting incompatible data. But is there a way to connect Elephant to a generative LLM to provide interactivity with reports, charts, text, narratives, et cetera, uh, something like an API? <coughs> if I were to try to do something like that, excuse me, uh, I think what I would approach it as is if I were to use NLQ, I would try to come up with a way that an LLM could have a, a, an English input and then turn that into some kind of NLQ output, use the Elephant API to then go request the report. Uh, however, uh, I, I would like to say that with a big caveat that that technology, that is a very untested technique. It's probably a general strategy that you could make hay with, but it's an untested technique. And every time the LLM produces something that is erroneous, it will turn around and ask Yellowfin a question. And then Yellowfin, kind of through no fault of its own, will answer the question that's being asked. And so you wind up taking the risk that you're going to produce some reports that uh, are essentially not necessarily incorrect. They're correct for what they were asked, but are not necessarily exactly what the user was asking for. And so that probably would be the big work that needs to be done in that area. It's a very interesting question and I love the idea. Um, I think that uh, it would be uh, it would be something that, you know, we just want to step into carefully and make sure it, in general it's generating the kind of results, the kind of reports that you would want to see for that, uh, for that sort of, uh, for the sort of inputs you're expecting from the, the audience that you're going to deploy it to. Okay. How can AI help with social media analysis? Um, I think that uh, most of the time that I've seen those kinds of uh, um, uh, most of the time that I've seen those kinds of uh, uh, um, applications in social media analysis, it's been around how do I how do I post around topics that are going to enhance my engagement. And so in that case, you would want to go grab posts, grab their engagement, and then treat that as your background data that you then train on. You can deploy that in something like Elephant. Um, and then uh, when you, uh, sometimes people will use it for things like keywords. So when they want to, when they want to publish some kind of, um, uh, um, you know, uh, a bid on a keyword that they want people to, uh, to have impressions for, uh, sometimes the value of those are estimated by machine learning. So you can, uh, you can use those couple, couple of applications. I'm not sure exactly what use case you're looking for, but those are a couple just right off the top of my head that I'm looking at. Um, let's see. And then we have, all right, we've got a lot of stuff coming in. Hector, uh, what is the future direction of Yellowfin in, to incorporate generative AI options like ChatGPT? Boy, I hate to waffle on this one because I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, like I said, I think there are some ways that I, as a, a systems integrator and kind of outside consultant of Yellow could probably look at incorporating on it, but I would tread with so much caution. Chat GPT is very new. Uh, it doesn't feel that way because there's been it's been so much of a, uh, a whirlwind just in the past. Uh, boy, I think the first time I saw uh, one of the GPT deployments was maybe in, in 2019 or 2020. Uh, so it feels like it's been around for a while. Um, and then it really picked up a lot of press, especially over the last year. Uh, so I know it, it feels like it's, you know, everybody's looking for ways to incorporate it, but I think the use case that you would want to use to incorporate it uh, would really need to be carefully considered. Because if you wind up going out and, and bringing that in for something like natural language queries to replace that kind of thing, and it winds up hallucinating, you could run the risk of putting bad data in front of people or inaccurate data in front of people. That's just, uh, that's just something we'd want to be obviously very cautious about. So sorry, I, I don't have a more direct, yes, this is what we're gonna do with it or, or anything like that. It's a little, um, uh, it's a little bit, um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe just more of a cautionary note for right now. Uh, this one's from Anil. Uh, are you using ML ops when deploying models? Great question. So um, there are a couple of components of ML ops that, uh, uh, that I'll personally use uh, that I kind of already mentioned. 
One is I use a tool, uh, an open source tool called uh, Nime pretty regularly because it, it just has a lot of great community support. Uh, not, to, not to promote it to you, everybody's kind of got their favorite. I run into a lot of teams that use Python. Um, that's actually you know very common. Some teams still using R. Uh, certainly anything like that is, is valid for whatever your use case is. Uh, in my case though, when I like to deploy these kinds of different um, uh, machine learning ops, obviously the, the testing of the, um, of the machine learning model that I'm producing is of, of real importance. And I actually have some processes that I'll use in the tool that, that I put together with this so that in the background, uh, it will go grab data, it will back test my models against that data. And I usually, I'm a big fan of ensemble techniques, so I'll tend to have multiple models deployed, but how those models are combined and what features they're looking at is a matter of huge search. So because compute power is very cheap, in my ML models, I'll typically go through a big search of different inclusion and exclusion of features, as well as a lot of inclusion and exclusion of particular algorithms that are going to be able to participate in the voting of the ultimate ensemble model. And then I'll take that ensemble and I'll deploy that into a standard interface for my above the database calls into a machine learning model. So net net, uh, definitely I'm using, you know, quite a few, uh, there's quite a bit of process there in terms of just both optimizing the fitness function as well as testing all of those in the background and then deploying them. But um, there are also some standard ML ops tools, uh, especially if you're using something like AWS that uh, they have kind of pipelines for that sort of thing. Uh, if you deploy your ML in, in a, say a tool like Spark, uh, then uh, you might be using Databricks or, or something in the cloud to actually facilitate those, those operations. Those are great. The key thing there is once you actually use the ML ops and you produce that model, you've got to have some way to to kind of democratize that com content so that it comes out into a more um, uh, broad audience. And that's the part that I really, when I consult, that's the piece that I really see a lot of businesses struggling with. Antonio, this architecture uh, requires AI professionals to create the models and implementation time. The cost is very high. Um, are these the only tools that are available in Yellowfin? So um, again, kind of like backtracking on onto an earlier question, there were the uh, some of the other tools available, um, uh, assisted insights, uh, which is some demonstrations I've done before. Maybe I'll include that actually in the, the next webinar where I go through some details on building these things, as well as signals. So those are available as uh, intelligence features that are on the fly models that are built, and then look at that data. And so. So assisted insights, like I had or analysis of say variance of categories or explaining uh, a spike or something like that, where you wanna actually go through and have an outside tool go through and do the search of all of the different dimensions that might have contributed to that variance and then rank them according to some intelligence so that you, you actually see hopefully a very beneficial explanation of what's causing. Um, on the other hand, if you uh, use signals, uh, you can get some sense of disruption on time series. That's really, uh, I think it's a great feature for, uh, especially for operational teams or other teams looking to stay on top of their data, be notified when something behaves out of profile uh, from its recent behaviors. So those are things that are immediately available in Yellowfin without building anything else. And it builds those models for you uh, on the fly as you're, as you're looking at the information. Um, and then, yes, I think I agree with you. I think that in the in, on the outside, going to, say, contractors or something like that, sometimes building those models can be expensive. However, I found that a lot of the expense is not in building the model. It's in the planning and integration of the model into a business. And I think if we could make that easier, my opinion is there's just a ton of value in, in being able to do that. Okay, let me scroll through. Antonio, uh, the dash dashboard presented is very ugly. Are there other types of graphs, labels with pretty visuals? Yes, there actually are tons. I threw this one together and I'm sorry if it wasn't aesthetically pleasing. Um, there are a lot of different uh, ways that we can actually present this in yellow. And I'll just show you really quick, uh, just so I don't um, leave you with the sense that, uh, what I've put together here is the only thing that's possible. Yeah. 
And I'm going to share my screen really quick just to walk through that. Might also be the screen was a bit pixelated because of use. But here we have some, some better looking dashboards. Any of these kinds of reports are available or these kind of dashboards can be created. Yellowfin actually has some tremendous styling capabilities. Um, and so I didn't show that off so much in this because I was concerned a little bit more about showing the functionality, being able to um, uh, incorporate those machine learning models. So I was really kind of more focused on that piece of it. But Yellowfin's able to do uh, and customization around uh, the different uh, types of content that you want to display. And all of that machine learning can be incorporated in the same way in these you know, highly styled and thought through dashboards, uh, as opposed to mine, which were pretty rudimentary. All right, thanks for the question. From Arthur, hi Chance, please let me know if you uh, have already used a custom advanced function with R because it seems it's not possible to set the R script path with Yellowfin 9.7 in a Windows environment. Um, yes, in fact, I actually wrote a plugin that integrates R into Yellowfin myself as an advanced function. So uh, feel free to contact me afterwards. It's open source on GitHub. I think it's Yellowfin R role. Um, and so the code's actually available there if you want to go grab it and build it or, you know, feel free to contact me and I can help you with that. I know there's a, a plugin on the, um, uh, um, the Elephant Marketplace as well. And I haven't used that since I had written my own uh, sometime before. I just kind of have always stuck with that. But uh, that may have an issue on Windows that you're referring to. But, you know, feel, like I said, feel free to contact me and I will um, help out with that after. All right. I think at this point, we're probably going to go ahead and wrap it up then. Thanks, everybody, for attending this uh, Ask Me Anything session. Uh, hope you learned something. Hope you got something out of the, uh, uh, the different techniques. And like I said, we'll be uh, doing a more detailed webinar, which will be uh, not so much an Ask Me Anything format as much as a step-by-step -step, uh, on some of the benefits of using these kinds of machine learning. I think I'm going to take some of the questions that were asked today and incorporate incorporate them into that. So show up for that and you'll get a little more detail on how to build some of these things and uh, um, and a more complete walkthrough of how we actually deploy these machine learning models and, and a bit more of a how-to story. All right, everybody take care. Have a good day. Thanks for attending.